I heard the doctor told the office one day. A friend of his was coming out and he said, the doctor's in there and, and he's so happy. He's got a little piece of paper, it's rather dog-eared and uh, it, it's from a black man, a very, very black, black man. Down in uh, South Africa. He, he lives in Durban. His name is Duna, D-U-N-A. When I told this story up in the Carolinas uh, four or five years ago, a man at the back kept nodding his head, nodding his head, and afterwards he said, my, I like the story on Duma. I said, did you hear it before? He said, no, but my daddy was the pastor you were talking about. Duma came in a church and heard the gospel for the first time, and he ran to the altar. And when he got up, he was like bunny and spirit, and the burden loose from off his shoulders, fell from off his back, into an empty sepulcher, and he ran down the aisle praising them all. Well, that's what, I mean, you know, that's not the really other thing to do in the Baptist church. Go leaping down the aisle and praising God. The pastor of the door said, well, how are you? And he enjoy the service. He said, well, can I do anything for you? He said, yes, give me a shirt. The pastor said, give you what? Give me a shirt. Well, you've never been in the church before. No, I haven't. Ah, oh, you're the man that went to the altar. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. No, 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 no. He said, one man went down to the altar. I'm a new man. I'm not the man that went down to the altar. Isn't it terrible when you get so excited about being saved? You know, the first six months you're saved are God's chosen people. And after that, we're God's chosen people. Oh, have you any education? No. Have you been to Bible school? No. That was a big advantage you didn't know about. Nobody brainwashed him. I can't give you a chance. The man turned up again a month after. Going out, the pastor said, well, how are you? Uh, should I help you? He said, yes, give me a church. Oh, now I remember who you are. Well, you haven't been in this church for over a month, have you? No, sir. I haven't been in any other church. Where did you go? I went up the road outside of Durban, and, and I came to a forest, and I found a footpath. And then I found a stream, and then I found a cave, and I took a rock, and I made a mark on the wall. And I went in that cave for 21 days and nights and said, Lord, you, you tell me whether I'm going to preach. I don't want to listen to men. Either you tell me I am or I'm not, and if you tell me, all hell won't shake me. And he said, the Lord said, I've called you to preach, and I'll give you a healing ministry. He said, what? Give you a healing ministry. Well, I talked to the deacons about it. <clears throat> and the deacons said, you know, across the tracks we have a little shanty just made of metal and uh, there are only five people go there. <laughs> so we let him preach to them because after all he's no education and no training and, uh, you know, in three or four weeks they'll be fed up and listen to him and church goes, he's done. The strange thing is that church is going even today, 40 years after, uh, tomorrow morning, uh, really tomorrow morning in, uh, over there in uh, South Africa now. And you know, they'll have 1,400 people there listening to this amazing man. Yes, God healed the sick through him. He called the elders, meet me at the hospital, we need to pray. He called the elders one day, meet me at the hospital. And they checked in with the lady at the desk, you know, and said, uh, 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 a pastor said, I want to pray for so-and-so. She said, yes, he's in Ward 13. You can't really pray for somebody. Ward 13, <coughs> Ward 13 is the morgue. The pastor just walked down the aisle and the deacon went to say, the, uh, <coughs> Pastor, um, <coughs> Pastor, uh, this, 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 this is, this is the morgue. He said, yeah, we've got to pray for the right man. Uh, number 21 here. So he pulled the screen over and there was a man lying, you know, so still and quiet. And little Juma pulled the cloth off him. And then he climbed on top of the body just like Elijah did later and put his hands on the body. And he said, in the name of Jesus Christ, who is the resurrection and the life, rise and walk. And the corpse went, 
Well, if the cult is not good with me on top of it, I'd have hit the ceiling, I'm sure of that. But do you know what happened? The cult got down and walked home. A little black man who had no preaching certificate and no background. Poor soul, he only had God. Isn't it terrible when you've only God? You know, when you can't look on your diploma and say, that's where I fail. I mean, that's where I, I got my diploma. And then you look at the other one, and that's where I got my PhD, and that's where I got something else. Hey, but wait a minute. Are you suggesting that man has run 30 years on one fill-up? You've got a new automobile, you expect it to last with one fill-up of gas till you die? The trouble with most people, they had a Pentecost 20 years ago, 30 years ago. The fire's gone out. I forget the day, it was maybe the 17th of November, when the little black man went into that cave. Do you know what the smart man did? Every year since then, he's gone back in that cave for 21 days and nights along with God to get a new anointing, to get a new vision, to get a new friend. He's just want to go and get blessed and help and say, I remember when I took smoking and I took drugs and prostitution and things. Well, that's great, for the heaven's sake, don't build a tent there. Go up and possess the land. Go hide thyself. I hear teachers say, well, I can't take time off. You don't have a church to start to know, I don't. How do you live? I live by faith. One woman came to one of our meetings, she said, Oh, I like to hear Brother Raymond teach in the morning. He's great in the morning, but at night he gets so noisy. I don't like him at night. But she said, I enjoy him in the morning, she said. And I, I don't think I've enjoyed anybody better. She said, I'm going to write him a nice check uh, tomorrow and bring it. The other lady said, don't do that. Why? You see, because he was my faith. Isn't it amazing? Go <clears throat> hide thyself. That's a hardy thing to do. I guess many of you tithe, maybe all of you tithe. Tithe what? Your money? That's easy. Take your notebook out, write the check. That's tithe to God and an offer. You tithe your time. The scripture says, bring all your tithes. That's <laughs> the, the, the problem, you see. Sing all your tithes. And if you give God a tenth of every day, that's 24 hours, that's 2 hours and, uh, what, uh, 2 hours and 24 minutes every day. And then on top of that, you give him an offer. I'll tell you what, if everybody tithes their time and tithes their tongues as well, the church of God would be in vastly different shape than what it's in tonight. Go hide thyself. He lives by faith. I see Elijah so big, he doesn't even get into Hebrews 11 where all those giants of faith are. And if ever you uh, feel you need to get proud, you know, some people say, well, you can't live without sin. Everybody needs a little bit of sin to keep you humble. Well, why not have a lot and keep you real humble? When you sin to take you humble, all I need to do to get my faith in the dust is read Hebrews 11, where men and women subdued kingdoms, brought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of life, and not one of them ever had a Bible. Look how much they did without the Bible. You and I have got 66 volumes. You brought them to church with you tonight. So much they did without the word of God. You and I have the complete revelation. God has another word to say to humanity if the world lasts a million years. He said it all. As the old hymn, how firm a foundation says, What more can he say than to you, he has said? Elijah the man of faith. The raven fed him in the morning and fed him in the evening. Maybe that means we should only eat two meals a day, I don't know. But what that happened, the brook dried up. 
before the rain would start bringing the food, the brook dried up, the natural resources dried up first. And then he heard the voice of the Lord saying, get up and go, where do I go? Go down the road, you'll meet a woman there. A widow woman. And tell her to feed you. Oh Lord, I can't go out. This is a test of humility, isn't it? I mean, who wants to sponge on a woman apart from radio evangelists? <coughs> uh, you're not going to ask a little widow woman to feed you, are you? Oh, put your pride in your pocket. He meets the little woman and says, well, you, you, you make me a cake. And she says, well, I suppose I may as well die today or tomorrow. What did you say? She says, I'll make you a little cake. I was going to make one for my son and my spouse. We were going to eat it and what? Die! This man's scared of being the death of thousands of people. They spread of heaven, there were no crops. You want revival without any suffering. Maybe revival will only come to America through revolution. Maybe our option really is this. Either we concentrate in prayer or we pray in concentration camps. Which do you want? God isn't concerned about standard oil or anybody else. People say, well, if we can't have money, uh, uh, the missions are going to close down together. All the streamlined, streamlined evangelism you see tomorrow on TV, Almighty God, pass it, pass by it, and all our computers, and all our Bible schools, and all our seminaries, and send revival up in Northeast India. That, that's re, a very repetition of the Acts of the Apostles. Signs and wonders and miracles, the dead have been raised. And I like the phrase that, 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 that Paul Coughlin gives there. He says, this was not imported. It wasn't imported. Nobody told them about gifts of the Spirit. Nobody told them about speaking in tongues. Nobody told them about miracles. Nobody told them about interpretations. Nobody told them about signs and wonders. God came in his sovereign life. And this is the only answer. It's not an alternative, it's the only answer for our day. And God has said he has poured out his spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And on my servants and handmaids, not my bishops, not the leaders of our Bible schools. Where did Jesus go for his disciples? Did he knock on the door of the sons and twins? Did he go to the temple and ask the high priest or the best and most Perspective scholars he had, no, he went to a fisherman and a tax gatherer. God takes the things that are not. Suddenly people have said to me, Did you ever meet Smith Wigglesworth? Yes, I did. He was a character. Some of you read his book, some of you read the Smith Wigglesworth. You know who he was, anyway? He? he was the oddest character in the world. He was in a meeting not far from my home. There's a lady at the front there with a big tummy on her. And he thought, well, that old girl can't be pregnant. She's far too old. So while they were singing, he went down and he bellowed in her ear. Are you pregnant? No, no, no. He's got a big voice. He said, close your eyes. He did. He took his face and spit in the stomach like that. He said, you're healed. Well, right, if he was rather dead, one of the two did. I mean, you, you, you don't need a woman in the stomach like that with a she's been kicked by a mule. There's no way of repeating it. On four occasions, people were raised from the dead through that man. And yet I want to tell you tonight, I've seen signs and wonders and miracles. I used to go off with Miss Truman. I took a Bible class a number of times in the Carnegie Hall in Pittsburgh. Talked with her many times with Dave Wilkerson, had dinner with her, supper with her, breakfast with her, talk with her. We saw some great miracles there and in our own ministry earlier. Blind people got to see, cripples walked and what have you. But that's not the answer for America today. America has had more healing in the last 30 years than all the nations under heaven put together, but where are we? You know what the greatest miracle is that Almighty God can do? The greatest miracle Almighty God can do is take an unholy man out of an unholy world, make that unholy man holy, put him back in an unholy world, and keep him holy. 
Takes all the power of the atonement to do that, plus the indwelling of the Spirit of God and all the promises of God. And what God is looking for in this day is not people with accurate theology. He's looking for people with pure hearts. He's looking for people that are totally selfless in their desires. He's looking for people who want to see God glorified. All right, let me hurry here. He went and the lady made a cake. And then he said, make yourself a cake. And she goes back to the barrel and finds it full to the top and this little oil can is shooting like an Oklahoma gusher. No, I don't think so. I think she took the last handful of meal out of that barrel every day and put the last pot of oil. That's the way God tests faith. I guess I know 20 millionaires and multi-millionaires. Many of them tell me I've opened sesame to their bank accounts. Any time, I've never asked anybody for a penny since I left a very fine church in 1949, and that's a few years ago. It's over 30. And I got my boys through school and college and university and never asked for a dime, I never will. I believe every time we ask for money, it's a slap in the face of God. He's promised to supply our needs. Not what I think I need, but what he thinks I need. We don't have to trail God's name in the dust. To build some monument, to send you tithes, to keep somebody's private jet up in the air. Each day, until God sent her harvest, she made a cake. And one day Elijah came in and she said, and now, now I found you out. I see who you are now. You, you come into my house and, and, and my baby died. Oh, he said, don't worry about that. I, I didn't like to tell you this, it's rather egotistical, but I'm the greatest preacher in the world. I'm the greatest miracle worker in the world. Oh, we can take holy things and make showmanship out of it. To me, the holiness of God is too great to go on TV programs. Tell me this, when you come here tomorrow or the church you go to, are you going there to meet God or are you going to hear a sermon about Him? I believe 99% of people who go to church tomorrow are going to hear a, want to hear a sermon about God, not meet a holy God. Elijah said, give me the chart. And he prayed and nothing happened. He prayed again and nothing happened. The third time he prayed, he ran up into a loft. Have you got a loft in your life or a basement and an old chair where you always feel you're nearer to God than any other place? He ran up into a loft and he prayed. No, this time he laid himself on the corpse, a sign of his compassion and love, and he prayed. And the child's spirit came into it again. Now, if I were a painter, I'd like to paint that. I'd like to paint the man coming down that staircase outside the house with a, a little laughing child in his arms and a woman there. Yeah, do you think he went up to the lady and said, uh, excuse me, the kid's alive? Hmm? I think he went down so full of joy and said, hey, look, your son liveth. Do you remember what she said? By this I know the heart of man of God, not by the barrel of meal, not by the oil, by this, by what? By the fact that he brought life where there was death. Isn't that the business of the church? You happy Christians who are dead in trespasses and in sin? Jesus didn't come into the world just to make bad, bad men good. He came into the world to make dead men live. Well, that looks great, doesn't it? By this I know that I was a man of God. Who was the greatest man of prayer in the Old Testament? Jacob? Not. You say he prayed all night. He didn't intend to. He prayed all night because he's in the jam. <laughs> uh, wouldn't you pray all night if your brother was coming to murder you? You'd have a police escort round the house. I seen a crowd of men coming. One of my scouts came and told me it's your brother. No, no, tell me my brother. The last time I saw my brother, he said, I'll kill you next time I see you. Now look, <clears throat> uh, get all the cattle here. Give him just a few of the sheep and if he's pacified, he didn't want to give too much away. A few sheep, if he'll take them. And if you have to get him, get him them all. Uh, and then the camels. Uh, but, but, you know, if you can pacify him, do your best. And then he sent his wife and family away. And then he, he, he stepped over a brook and he got behind a rock. And just as he got behind the rock, somebody jumped on him. Well, who do you think he thought it was? 
Huh? His brother. My brother killed him. Boy, I'm going to die fighting. That doesn't sound like a church prayer meeting. It sounds like a church business meeting, but <clears throat> not a church prayer meeting. And the more he saw the tide of a grip job on him, and suddenly he realized, this is not my brother. You know what I learned out of that situation? That when Jacob went into that night of prayer, he was a tall, handsome prince. And after a night of wrestling there, he dragged his leg the rest of his life. He was a cripple. And the reason we don't pray is the flesh is too weak to pray. The body gets tired. Or some other petty excuse. The rest of his life he dragged a withered leg. But he was changed to being a prince with God. I think the greatest man of prayer in the Old Testament was Elijah. Upon me was Moses. You know, America has a very vivid, strange history. It's been such a blessing to the world, it's been such a curse to the world. A curse? Well, Mormonism was born here and that's cursing the world. Jehovah's Witnesses were born here and they're cursing the world. Spiritism was revived here and that's cursing the world. Man alive, we talk about the Pentecostal revival in Brazil, but brother, there's a shocking revival of spiritism and voodooism in Brazil right now. And in some of those South American countries. We curse the world. But you know, you can tip the scales the other way. We have had some of the greatest men of prayer in modern history. Just the other day, my dear, wife and I were in a shop. The lady came up. Hey, Mr. Raymond, how are you? I heard you preach a number of times. She said, oh, see, I've got a collection of old books. In one of your books you quote David Payson. And she has a great library. And she said, nobody has ever quoted David Payson except you. And I've got a volume on his life. Would you like it? I said, sure. I've been mine to my son. David Payson. I call him Praying Payson of Portland, Oregon. He had a bedroom like the floor like this, you know, not that nice wall-to-wall rug like you have. Hard like this. And when he died, they found a groove in the floor. And a few inches away, another groove in the floor. And they found out that when he prayed, he used to pray with his hands. He used to pray and then like this. And, and he wore through grooves in the, in, the, in the wooden floor of his bedroom with intercession. Praying Hyde. I preached in a conference in Lake Okoboji in Iowa some years ago, 1951 actually. A dear missionary came. He said, did you ever meet Praying Hyde? I said, no, I'd like to have him. Oh, I heard him there in the fire clock convention in India. A friend of mine said to him one day, Mr. 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 Hyde, could, could, could I pray with you tomorrow? Just, just let me pray with you once. He said, all right, meet me at 9.30. And he said, my friend went to the back room at 9.30. And there was John Hyde, and we knelt down to pray. And he said for 15 minutes, it was total, total silence. I, I didn't pray, he didn't pray. And then he said, I prayed. But he said, at the end of 10 minutes, I prayed all I knew how to pray. And then John Hyde started to pray. And he hadn't been praying very long when there was a knock at the door. And this man said, well, I'm not going to the door. This is the only chance I'll ever get to pray with this man. I'm not going to the door. And there was a loud knock at the door. And a loud knock at the door. Finally, somebody pushed the door open and said, Mr. Hyde, uh, you, you, you have a schedule at three o'clock to preach on praying. And it's now a quarter of three. His friend said, it can't be a quarter of three. We started praying at ten o'clock. It can't be a quarter of three. And he looked at his watch and found it was a quarter of three. They had been praying for five hours. Portland of Payson. Praying. Payson of Portland. John Hyde. E.M. Downs. 
You can buy seven volumes of the end bound. They cost you about three or four dollars each. You can buy them all in one book. I, I put them all together. You can buy them as you need. It's called a treasury of prayer. And we think all the great men of prayer lived a hundred years ago. There's a man who lives 50 miles away from where I live. He's 32 years of age. He prays 10 hours a day. Here in America right now. Hmm? Come on, you fellows that come by and throw your strength. How much stamina do you have to pray? How much vision? How much passion? How much burden? There's a man outside Waco, 60 years of age, who prays six hours a day. Again, I live in an area of celebrities. David Wilkinson lives behind us. The Agassi Force just up the road. Kenneth Free, Keith Green lives down the road. Barry, Go- Barry Maguire lives just up above us. Dallas Home lives just behind us. Dave Wilkerson's building his new place a mile from us. Second chapter of Acts, we've just bought ten, a- ten acres by the side of us. Jimmy Owen has just bought ten acres. Uh, 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 second chapter of Acts, have bought a hundred acres. Jimmy Owen has bought ten acres. Star studied area. You know, the most attractive thing is we have a prayer meeting on Friday nights in a mansion across the road from where we live. A Quaker family, very lovely people. And we get a hundred to a hundred and twenty students, and you know how far they come? They come as far as two hundred and fifty miles round trip every Friday night just to pray. Not to hear celebrities sing. What have you got singing upside down? Did the disciples say, Lord, teach us to sing? Did Jesus say, My house should be called a house of song for all nations? Did Paul say, Sing without ceasing? Did Jim Jen say, if you're sick, sing one to another? Did Jesus say, my house should be called a house of song for all nations? You now sick the churches that you can put a show on and charge five dollars and you can get two or three thousand people to go and, and they'll go a hundred miles to the concert and it'll cost them a lot in gas and they have to eat when they go and they go to the show and, and then it's over and they get back two o'clock in the morning and, and they'll go by the thousand and you book the same hall for a prayer meeting and charge them nothing, you get nobody there. That's how sick the church is. And nobody loves singing more than I love. I finished where I began, no man is greater than his prayer life. The greatest living expositor in the world, I talked with him in London a few years back, and he said to me, Brother Ravenel, I do not have any trouble, I do not have any trouble writing commentaries on the Bible. I have no trouble. The hardest thing in my life is prayer. Prayer. I found it so difficult to pray. I think that a prayer closet should be the most magnetic place in our lives. One single, simple thing. You know, in England, in society, the greatest honor is to be invited into the presence of the Queen of England. And when you go, you receive instructions how to go, what kind of clothes to wear, how to observe the right manners. Now, you just don't go in your old clothes and drive up in your beaten up old truck or something. You go there all neat and tidy and everything, and you're told when to bow and what to say and how to do it. Such an honor to go into the presence of the Queen. Do you uh, ever visualize when you go to pray that as you kneel in your little humble home or mansion that you're talking to the same God that Elijah talked to, the same God that Jesus talked to, the same God that Moses talked to? That little you, because of Jesus Christ making us a kingdom of priests unto God, that we can just go into his holy presence In the revival in Scotland, Duncan Campbell had had a series of meetings where God invaded the community. And he was in one church and nothing happened. He said the heavens seemed like brass. So he stopped the meeting. There were a lot of preachers here, a lot of church deacons there, a lot of men in the clerical attire. And he said, I do not sense God in this meeting. He pointed to a young man, Hamish, which is Scottish dialect for John, Hamish. The person or something. Ah, he said, laddie, would you stand up and pray? 
the boy was 16 years of age. 16. He had all the theologians, the preachers, the famous dignitaries in the Christian world, and he called on a 16 year old high school boy to pray. The lad he stood up. In Scotland, when they're contemptuous, they say, ah. The boy stood there and said, ah, what's the good of praying if we're not right with God? And he quoted Psalm 24, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. And he went on and recited it. And then he prayed. Ten minutes, twenty minutes, thirty minutes, forty minutes, forty-five minutes. And as he finished praying, it was just as though God pulled a switch in heaven and the glory of God came on that building. And he came on the dance hall at the other end of town. And he came on the tavern at the other end of town and they never opened after that. But you know why? Because when the boy finished praying with the authority of a man that sounded like a Jeremiah or an Elijah or a, a, a Isaiah, he just turned as though he could visibly see something and he said, Satan, get off this territory. Go out of this community in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Ghost. I command you through the blood of Christ and the power of the Spirit be gone. And as the devil pulled out, the glory of God came down. I get scared that God will keep one of his promises, you know. We like God's promises, if they're convenient for us. But remember, it wasn't to the Mormons, and it wasn't to the Mooniites that God said, I'll spew you out of my mouth, it was to his lazy, backslidden church, the Laodicean church, which is the day in which we're living. I'll spew you out of my mouth. And God says, hey, Moses, come here a minute. I know you're discouraged. I know you're weary of these people. I know they've broken your heart. You know they've broken my heart too. I'm as tired of them as you are. Now look, you go tell them, I'm going to wipe them out. I'm going to wipe the nation out. And out of your loins, I'm going to raise up a new nation. And if Moses had had half an ounce of ambition for himself, he would have said, Lord, I'm just so happy because I've had headaches and sleepless nights with this bunch that's so rebellious and lawless and disobedient. I can't wait till I stand on a rock tomorrow and say, Look, the Holy One of Israel is going to destroy you for your abominations and your sin. You're going to hell and you deserve it. But I want to tell you something before you go. He's keeping me here because I'm so holy. Do you know what Moses said in, he, in, in, in the 11th of Deuteronomy there? He says, Lord, the weight of this nation is such upon, so great upon me, you better do something or else kill me! In Romans 9, the Apostle Paul says, I could wish myself a curse. A plain translation from the Greek is this, I'll be damned if need be. It's my damnation, it's my destruction will release the mercy of God on my generation. When you go to your bed and sleep nicely tonight, they'll just be getting going around the casinos up there in Las Vegas and elsewhere else. And the discos, they'll be taking their clothes off. And the nakedness and the promiscuality. And now they tell me in France nobody goes to see the girls strip anymore. They go to watch acts of homosexuality. Do you think God's going to put up with a nation that has more Bibles? We have 600 million Bibles in the nation. And if you say there are 15 million Christians, that's four Bibles to each person. And we have more gospel radio broadcasts, and we have more churches, and we have more seminaries, and we have more Bible teaching and Bible companies than all the rest of the world put together. And yet we have more broken homes with divorce, more broken bodies with drugs, more broken bodies through venereal disease, more broken girls' bodies through homosexuality, through, through childbirth. Everything's broken. This nation has never been so broken, but you know what the greatest tragedy is? The greatest tragedy in the world tonight is a sick church in a dying world. The church of Jesus Christ isn't broken over it. He was born in Gethsemane. And that revival, and I'm through, that revival that is had in Nagaland, you know why it came to the surface? <clears throat> because for 20 years, a hidden group of people have been praying and travelling. For revival. I know some of the greatest praying people in the world. 
You couldn't get them to come and stand here publicly. They won't write an let you write an article about their prayer life. You know you can come on the platform and strut and show your ability in your scholarship and how clever you can maneuver a crowd, but I challenge you to start swaggering when you shut the door and you're alone with God, you don't swagger in the prayer closet. You can impress people but nobody impresses God. We're naked before him. God says, I'll utterly destroy this people. You know what? There's, there's, it's a very wonderful thing when God reaches from heaven and takes hold of a man. I only know one thing more amazing. That's when a man reaches up and takes hold of God. And God says to Moses, leave me alone. That's not Moses knowing that God has a grip on him. It's not Moses saying, God Almighty, take your hand off me. It's God saying, Moses, leave me alone. And the old Methodist hymn book paraphrases that. He says this, let Moses in the spirit groan and God cries out, let me alone. That's praying. Our praying is so feeble. Our praying has to close at nine o'clock. Tell the Holy Ghost to go home. I don't believe you can run a healthy church in America or anywhere else without that church having at least one night of prayer a week and the best time to have it usually is Friday night because folk don't have to go to work the next day. Every church I've been in, I've been in churches in the last three years that have four, five, six, seven thousand members. And my joy has not been to just see altars filled but to establish a prayer meeting on Friday night and in those churches they pray from nine o'clock at night till sometimes one and two o'clock in the morning. All earthly things with earth will fade away. But prayer grasps eternity. You can test your spiritual life, not by how much Bible knowledge you have. I'm not concerned that you know the Word of God, though that's good, but I want to know, do you know the God of the Word? I'm not just concerned you run with every burden to God. Does God lay any of his burdens on you? His yoke is easy. His burden is light. Most of us want to go to heaven having a hand clapping time, a good time. Five minutes inside of eternity again, we all wish we'd be more prayerful, more sacrificial, more obedient, more submissive. The government isn't going to get this nation out of trouble, and the banks aren't going to get us out, and the armies aren't going to get us out. It's going to take one great merciful act of God, or we are sunk. We've had more light, more privileges the last 25 years than all nations in the world put together. And people say, well, prayer can do anything. Well, read the 14th of Ezekiel, where God says, if the three greatest men that ever lived make intercession, I will not hear them, even for their own children. They won't save their own children. Never mind the nation. If I could find God time peace, and say, do you know what time it is on God's clock? You know what? I think we're not living in the last day. Not even living in the last hours. Not even living in the last minutes. I think we're living in the last moments before judgment falls and before revival comes. Father, we thank you tonight for this privilege of being in your house. We thank you for these precious friends that the world didn't have any pull on them tonight or they wouldn't be here. But Lord, many of us tonight have a broken down prayer life. Many of us know nothing of intercession. We need to get our hearts cleansed from selfishness and worldliness and carelessness and get centered on God himself. 
You need to be cleansed from all vanity and trivia. We need to get married to the will of God. We need to be totally spiritual. We need to hear your voice. We need to see as you see. We need broken hearts for a broken world, not just a broken nation, a broken world. You think of the millions locked up tonight, the Mohammedans and Buddhists and Confucianists and Muniites and others. Lord, we're not we're not penetrating their kingdoms, we're not we're not entering into the devil's dominion. Have mercy on us. Just with your head bowed and eyes closed, ask God what He wants you to do tonight and I'll ask the pastor to come and close the meeting.